Hi there, everybody. It is great to be with you opening the scriptures at Aletheia Online today. We are kicking off a brand new teaching series in the New Testament book of 1 Peter. And we've called it a then and now people. A then and now people. Let me explain in a few sentences what this name means. Christians have two important reference points that shape their life in the here and now. One reference point is a past reference point and the other is a future reference point. For Christians, the then that shapes their current life in large part is the work in the life of Jesus, what he came into the world to do. And then there's a future then reference point which God has promised to the followers of Jesus. And those two then reference points help help people understand how to follow Jesus faithfully in the here and now. Now we're going to be in chapter 1 of 1 Peter and the way that he opens this book really gives us the context and the why behind what he's writing. And if you think about those two different reference points in forming the now, Peter's writing to a people whose now is complex and it's difficult. So what we see from the first chapter is Peter drawing from these reference points, the then of Jesus' work in the past and the then of God's promise for the future. And in the entire book, he's going to very practically and very profoundly roll out the implications for the now for the listeners and for us as well. So go ahead and open your Bibles in a Bible app or in your paper Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to start in verses 1 through 13. 1 Peter 1, verse 1 through 13. And really in these first verses, we get the context for the entire book. He's going to state his case, if you will, make his main point, and then the rest of the book is him rolling out or applying his paradigm that he introduces here. Verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be, mul- be, be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, You believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to to them and they were, that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray and ask that he would help us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God, my prayer is that by your Holy Spirit, Peter's words would just expand our eyes and our hearts and our minds to 
fully lay hold of the extraordinary promises that you make to those who love and follow you. May we hear it with clarity in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was growing up, I remember an ad campaign that was run by a car manufacturer. And how it went was that it showed, you know, images of their car doing beautiful drives, driving through a windy mountain road, or driving along a, you know, a beautiful coastline. And the tagline of this ad campaign, which ran in many different iterations over many different years, was, it's the journey, not the destination. And this stuck with me as a younger man. I thought, wow, what a... What a great philosophy for life. It's the journey, not the destination. Then I had two road trips that profoundly changed my opinion that that tagline can be a philosophy for life. Both these road trips happened uh, when my wife and I had our two small kids. These were the first two major road trips with our kids. When, When my daughter was about six months old, we traveled from Providence down to Tennessee, to visit some family, and we stopped for dinner along the way, and all seemed to be going well until we stopped for that meal. And I'll save you the details, but needless to say, that restaurant would never be the same because of what my daughter did to it. The second road trip was one when my son was just a few months old, and my son really didn't sleep very well in the car. Half of the Half of the trip was spent with either my wife or I turned around from the passenger seat with a bottle or a pacifier just to get him occupied and get him to, to, you know, to sleep on the car. We stopped halfway and we all slept in the same hotel room. And I should say slept with two, you know, air quotes because no sleeping happened. Now here's what happened on those road trips is that at no point did I think it's all about the journey, not the destination. All I could think for most of those road trips was, it's the destination, it's the destination, it's the destination. I wanted the journey to be over. And in order to encourage myself, I had to think about the destination. In this opening of his letter, Peter wants to remind his listeners, these followers of Jesus who have been dispersed all over the Roman world, he wants to remind them about their destination. He wants to remind them that they are on a path towards a destination. And if he were writing to us today, he would say the same thing and encourage us in the same way. He would want to, he would want to remind the followers of Jesus here and now that they are en route to a destination that makes the difficulty of the journey worth every moment. One of my favorite images that I've heard used for describing the journey that followers of Jesus are on is them be described as pilgrims. Like maybe you've heard of the novel of the novel uh, uh, Pilgrim's Progress. And there's something about understanding that as a follower of Jesus, you are on a pilgrimage, and unless you remember the destination that you're heading towards, it will make difficult moments of the journey almost unbearable. But when we heed what Peter says, we can be encouraged at any point in the journey. Here's what I believe we discover out of this first chapter that applies to our lives, is that pilgrims set their hopes on the promise of the destination to keep their minds prepared to hold true to the path. Let me say that for you again. Pilgrims set their hope on the promise of the destination to keep their minds prepared to hold true to the path. Look at the way that Peter addresses these people that he's writing to. In the very first verse, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. These people that Peter is writing to are followers of Jesus who because of their faith have been dispersed all over the Roman world. They've been kicked out of their cities and their towns for their faith. And look how he addresses them, elect 
exiles. In this phrase, Peter captures the tension of being a follower of Jesus, that you are at the same time loved, called, cherished by God, and you experience alienation in the world in which you live. And you'll only truly be at home at the destination. And that's why pilgrims set their hopes on the promise of the destination. Now, these disciples were being persecuted in pretty significant ways. But let's be clear about something. Every follower of Jesus is going to experience suffering and resistance to differing de- degrees, but suffering and resistance nonetheless because of their loyalty to Christ. Jesus told his disciples that because they were faithful to him, they would be hated, they would be rejected, they would be ignored, they would be mocked and ridiculed. The scriptures also tell us that even if there might not be you know, external mock and ridicule, that there are spiritual forces of evil who aim to resist your loyalty to Christ. The Apostle Paul gives us the image of God's enemies firing flaming darts at followers of Jesus. Just imagine for a minute like how, how true this is. If you picture yourself, maybe in your place of work or in your classroom, you stand up in the middle of a meeting or in the middle of a lecture, and what you say is, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. I believe this word to be true. I am a full-fledged follower of Jesus. The likelihood is that you're not going to get pats on the back. Now, if you stood up and said something along the lines of, I'm spiritual, I'm a seeker, you might get some pats on the back. But many people, if they heard you say, I'm a follower of Jesus who believes what God has said about him in the scriptures, that he died and he rose again and he is king, there's going to be resistance, there's going to be mockery, there's going to be some, some de- derision from the world. Every Christian, every follower of Jesus experiences this tension of being an elect exile. That's why Peter wants his listeners and wants us to set our hopes fully on the promise of the destination. This is what he says down at verse 13. Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter wants us to set our hope fully on the grace that will be revealed to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the destination. If Christians are pilgrims, he's talking about the destination. What is that destination? Well, he starts talking about it in the verses above. He says here that you were born again to a living hope. This is in verse verse 3. Born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. This is the destination. Now, what does he mean when he talks about an inheritance? Well, if you looked up the word inheritance in your Bible, it would show up all over the place. So, I want to point maybe to two, two, two little passages out that give us a clear idea of what inheritance he's referring to. Jesus is giving a parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, and here's what he says will happen when Jesus returns. Matthew 25, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. From Jesus' words here, we understand that the inheritance is a kingdom that has been prepared for God's people. Well, the place that we get the most vivid picture of the realization of this kingdom is at the very end of the Bible in the book of Revelation. Here are four verses from Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. This is the inheritance promised. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, 
and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Right there, in those two verses, you can get an understanding of what the inheritance is. It's the kingdom of the, of the new heavens and the new earth that Jesus will bring about when he returns. Now think about the adjectives that Peter uses for that inheritance. These are key because pilgrims set their hope fully on the promise of the destination. So he describes this inheritance as imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. There's really only two inheritance choices, eternally speaking. For the followers of Jesus, the inheritance is this kingdom of the new, of the regenerated world. The other choice is choosing an inheritance that is perishable, that is fading. Think of it like this. If you make the destination of your life an amount of money in a retirement fund, that upon retirement you can then just enjoy and travel and do what you've dreamed of. Now, there's nothing wrong with retirement funds or investing or preparing for the future, nothing at all. But if that is your destination, it's perishable. It can perish according to the market forces. It can perish because of medical costs. It can perish because of inflation. It can perish because of a recession. Think about that second adjective, undefiled. To pick a destination that is of this world, in this world, is to pick a destination that can be defiled. The example that comes to my mind is, if you make a destination, say, your family, if your goal in life is to arrive at a point where you have where you have the kind of family that you've always dreamed of. Now, is there anything wrong with family? Absolutely not. Family is a gift from God, but it can't be the destination that you set your hope on. Think about the people in that family. The issue with family is that there's people in it, people who make choices, people who will decide to follow or not follow Jesus. Do we have a part in that as a family by training up kids in the way that they should go? Absolutely, but let's... Be really clear about something. Family can't be the destination. Can't be the destination. What about that third one? Unfading. You know, even if you pick a destination that stands the test of time, a legacy, or if books are written about you, what is guaranteed to fade and to perish? You are. I am. It's guaranteed. So the really, there's two options here. And the, the way that Peter encourages these followers of Jesus is he reminds them, he says, look, the inheritance promised from God to you is, is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. Pilgrims set their hope on the promise of the destination. This is powerful. And it has a profound effect on followers of Jesus. Specifically, it helps them to keep their mind prepared. Now, here's where we get to a really interesting image that we have to understand because when pilgrims set their, set their hopes on the promise of the destination, it helps them to keep their minds prepared to stay true to the path. We really get a fascinating image of this in verse 13. Where Peter says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The first part of that verse could be, is literally translated, gird up the loins of your mind. 
Now this is a really important image to understand, to, to get Peter's instruction and meaning here. A girdle back in Peter's day was, was it was a, like a leather belt that you used to tie up your tunic in order to prepare to run or to dive into some you know, manual labor work. So basically, if you were getting ready for action and for service and for work and for speed, you would gird up your loins. You would wrap up your tunic and prepare yourself. One of the really profound and kind of connecting places that we see this in the scripture is in the book of Exodus. When God is giving his people instructions for the Passover meal, he tells them to eat their meal with their belt on and their sandals on their feet. Because when he judges Pharaoh, he's going to send them out of Egypt quickly. So get this picture. God's people in the book of Exodus, they're in slavery and they're about to be freed and they're about to make a journey to, a, to the promised land, their destination. And God gives them the instruction to be prepared for it. This is the image that the Apostle Peter uses to describe the kind of mindset that we should have as followers of Jesus. But he applies it to our minds. He says, gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, see life as it really is. See it as the pilgrimage that it is. See it as the journey that it really is. Now, in the rest of the letter, he's going to roll out implications of this. But one of the ways that we see this impacting followers of Jesus is seen up in verse 6. When we gird up the loins of our mind, when we set our hope fully on the promise of the destination, what it does is that it gives us a joy that suffering can't take away. Look at verse 6. In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. He says, you rejoice while you're grieved. When you've girded up the loins of your mind, you can rejoice even when you're going through suffering and difficulty. Why can you rejoice? He told us. Because your inheritance, your destination is imperishable unfading, guaranteed. If you pick an inheritance in this life that is perishable, that is fading, that is defiled, you know what I know, that your joy is connected to that thing. If you make your destination in life a retirement fund and the economy you know, puts that into the toilet, your joy goes down with it. If you make your destination in life a great relationship, as that relationship falls apart, your joy goes down with it. If you make your destination in life the perfect picture of a family and your child is wayward or makes a decision that really breaks your heart, your joy goes down with it. Now these things shouldn't make us happy, not at all. But when you're a follower of Jesus and in your mind, because you've girded up the loins of your mind, your destination The hope in your heart and in your mind is set on the destination of the imperishable new heavens and new earth. You can have joy at any point in the journey. Peter's words in my mind bring up two really important questions. The first is this, and and I want to ask them to us. What is your hope set on? What is your hope set on? Maybe you're not a follower of Jesus and you're listening to this. And here's what I really want you to hear. We are all, every one of us, going to set our hope on something because we are created to have a a destination in mind that gives meaning to our life. You're going to put your hope in something. If you put your hope in anything other than the promise of the inheritance of God for his people through faith in Jesus, that hope will perish, will fade, and will be defiled. You are setting yourself up for guaranteed 
disappointment. And I, my longing and my prayer and my hope is that you would turn to Jesus, put your faith in his work and in the promise that he's made to all those who follow him, that you might gain an imperishable, undefiled, unfading inheritance. For the Christians listening to me, Peter is trying to get our attention onto our inheritance, to make us think about it, to make us remember how extraordinary it is. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, do you realize that your story ends well? Your story has a happy ending. You will go through suffering in this life. You will experience resistance, maybe from the opinions of people, maybe from the spiritual forces of evil, from all different areas. You will have highs and lows in this life. But if you're a follower of Jesus, your destination is imperishable, unfading, undefiled, kept in heaven for you. Think about that description in Revelation chapter 21. Every tear wiped away. The presence of God with us. Every cause of sin and evil sent out of that kingdom so that we can shine like lights in the kingdom of our God. When you fix your hope there, no matter what comes in this life, you can have joy and you can have endurance because that destination makes this all worth it. Better yet, fixing your hope on that destination Peter says that our trials serve to glorify God on the day of visitation. When Jesus appears, every difficulty you've been through in this life, every experience of pain and of heartache for your faithfulness to Christ will glorify him all the more on the day of his return. Your suffering isn't meaningless. It isn't meaningless, quite the opposite. It is preparing for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's the first question. What is your hope set on? Here's the second one. Is your mind prepared? Is your mind prepared? Peter wants us, in view of this extraordinary inheritance, to gird up the loins of our mind. Have you done that? Do you realize that you're on a pilgrimage? Do you realize that in this life, this isn't where you find your inheritance? No, you're called to faithfulness to Jesus in this life. You're called to proclaim his name. You're called to live for his glory. And that will come with difficulty. That will come with resistance, but it also comes with with promise. It's a little bit like, like being... In a country that is, that is attacked or, be, or besieged and pretending as if it's peacetime when it's wartime, if we have the wrong view of this life, that this is the be-all, end-all, it, our minds won't be in the right posture for us to flourish and thrive as followers of Jesus here. We need to gird up the loins of our mind. How do we do that? Maybe you find in yourself as I have found many times that my head isn't in the game, in a sense. I haven't girded up the loins of my mind. How do we return to it? How do we remember it? This verse in my mind is the key. Verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. I love what Peter says here. Though you haven't seen Jesus, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you rejoice with joy inexpressible. How do we gird up the loins of our mind to follow Jesus faithfully? It's when we love him. Our love for Jesus is the fuel for our hope. Our love for Jesus is the fuel for our joy. We rejoice. Why? Because we have a Savior who came into the world and he experienced resistance and hatred 
and difficulty and complexity. And we know how his story went. He was vindicated. He went through suffering into glory. And he said, everyone, everyone who has lost, who has suffered for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. We rejoice because we love him. And then he says that this fascinating phrase, and I've been wrestling with this for days, where he says that you rejoice obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. In Peter's mind, we have, in a sense, obtained the outcome of our faith. We have obtained the salvation of our souls. How can Peter say, you have been saved and you will be saved? You have obtained the outcome of your faith and you will obtain the inheritance at the revealing of Jesus Christ. Here's why, here's why. Because the best thing about our inheritance, we already get to experience. The love of Jesus. We are not pilgrims who are waiting for the experience of our destination there one day only. No, we have the love of Christ upon us. We love him because he first loved us. Jesus came into the world and experienced those things for us. For us, because he loved us. When you keep the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, the object of our love and our faith, Jesus Christ, when you keep him in mind, it is that that empowers you. It is him that empowers you to gird up the loins of your mind because you realize your inheritance is guaranteed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The presence of God is guaranteed by the one who was dead and rose again and ascended and promised that he will return to take us into glory. He will renew the heavens and the earth and we will shine like lights in the kingdom of our Father. The one who rose from the dead guarantees it to you and to me. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, what a passage and what a promise. What a reminder of the hope that you've given us in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for anybody listening to my voice who's not a follower of Jesus. Give them the gift of repentance. Help them to chat with someone, to pray with them, that they might put their faith in Christ God, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are listening to this. God, may we who follow you be reminded of our inheritance. Be reminded that we are on a pilgrimage and that our destination gives profound meaning to the difficulties that we experience here and now. God, help us to gird up the loins of our mind, to follow Jesus faithfully, whatever may come our way. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. If you need prayer for anything, please let us know in the chat. I imagine a sermon like this has brought up some prayer requests. We would love to pray with you. Aside from that, take this word with you into this week for the glory of God's name and for your joy. God bless you.